Um, today we're here to have a friendly chat about building automation control system, how control system in the uh, new technological world is helping everybody out. Whether you're designing a structure, whether you're designing a system, whether you will be working with uh, electronic devices or whether you'll be working with building structure facilities, things that we're talking about today will benefit you somewhere in your career, somewhere in your future life. Our presentation today is going to have about two parts. We'll see how it goes on. Uh, feel free to have a conversation with me. Just raise your hand whenever you want to ask a question. Don't wait until the end. Anything comes to your mind, you want to uh, take advantage of the time, let's do that. Uh, the first part we will be more uh, design specific, will be more about, will be more general. You need to know uh, how to shape your mind when you want to think about control system. You don't necessarily have to be a control system or automation designer, but you will be working with people who make a facility functional. So a lot of architecture students here. When you're designing a facility, when you're designing a hospital, when you're designing a classroom like this, when you're designing a residential home, or when you're designing an office, you need to think about how the people actually start using that space, how people start interacting with the walls, with the light switches, with the structure, how they walk through the path, how they um, take care of the functionality of the space that you're designing for them. So this is how you want to think about it. The building automation students, the way, of course, you care about control system is how to provide tools and uh, elements to the users to actually make use of that function. So you will start making a sense of what, what it is and that I'm trying to get as we step up. But the first part of the uh, talk will be more about design. And the second part is uh, mostly for building automation and IT students who actually want to step into this industry. Our company, Arso Automations, is all about designing integrated control system. So anything that is there, whether it's an industrial plant, whether it's a food production facility, whether it's a uh, residential home, or uh, even a hospital or a school. Like right now, we're in a classroom, right? This classroom needs a control system. It got light, it got HVAC system, it got uh, audio system, it got table. So anything around us needs a way of controlling. And uh, we focus on designing the control system. You will see what I mean by that. Um, so that's where we specify. We take a look at how people start using things and we try to automate that, try to take things off the table from their day-to-day -day tasks and day-to-day -day interaction with the surrounding environment to make their lives more productive. Um, I myself, I have an engineering background. Um, in undergraduate studies, I studied mechanical engineering. In graduate studies, I did an MBA, and uh, I followed up with industrial management. So I have nothing to do with electronics, with IT, or anything. <laughs> Everything that I have learned, I've learned it in business. I've learned it in like actually doing, getting on top of it. And especially when I was studying, there was nobody teaching anything like that to us in the school. I'm glad that this George Brown stepped up and like introduced such program to students right now. Uh, so let's get started. So we live in a city with uh, so many structures. We got Bungalow homes, we got brand new custom homes, we got mansions, then we got high rises, then we got commercial buildings, then we got the schools, then we got the hospital, different types of buildings. Each of these buildings have different functions throughout the city. They got basically, oh, we're losing a little bit of the slide, that's fine. Uh, consider basically a residential condo. Your residential condo has 500, 400, 300 condo units in them. Each of these units uh, basically have different elements that you interact with every day. From your lights, from your door, from your HVAC system, from your, the door that you open and close, from the hardwood that you walk on. So don't get too excited. Don't think about uh, like, you know, massive technologies and don't think about like, you know, crazy IT system. When I talk about Functions, anything around you is providing a function. The chair that you sit on is providing a function. It's in a structure that is satisfying a need for you. It's satisfying the need that you don't get too tired. You sit down on it, it has to balance the force that you want to put on it, it has to balance it, and it has to be strong enough with the four legs to satisfy your weight, right? So it's satisfying a function. Other things around us are satisfying a function as well. Our lights, 
are basically providing uh, brightness to us so that we can see things. These are simple things that at the end of this presentation, we will get back to it, why it's important to think about it every time that we want to design something. We usually get so excited, you want to get to an architectural plan, you want to get to a uh, building automation system. We always want to get things done and have the magic happening and have the whole plan in front of us. But in order to get to a functional plan, you need to go back to the basic, and that's what we're doing right now. So basically, in a residential condo, you got different things. When it becomes a custom home, you got more things happening. You probably have entertainment system, you have surveillance systems around you. And uh, when it gets to a hospital, for example, you got way more things. You got lights, you got security system, you got uh, your temperature control, you got uh, all the devices, the healthcare facilities. They got, there's so many different things that a hospital has to handle, right? The whole idea about building automation is to basically put everything together and create an intelligent system that understand what is happening at every time and how can we minimize the interaction of the people inside that structure, inside that building. So uh, the reason why we need to do that is because we need to make our lives more efficient. Many years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, people were only farming, people were only uh, having basic lives simply because they only had basic tools and they had to take care of a lot of things themselves. As the technology grows, it grows exponentially because you invent something, that invention helps you invent something else much faster, then that helps you grow your technology much, much faster. And this is basically the thing we are after. We are after making our lives more efficient by cutting down your stupid day-to-day -day things that you're doing every day. Right? So we want to automate the lives. It's not because we're lazy. It's not because we're trying to go lie down on the beach and enjoy the sun. It's basically because as if we have things off our table, then we have more time. We have a bigger vision to create new things and like, you know, have a more productive life, whether it's at office, whether it's at home, whether it's at any surrounding environment that you have. So again, before, this was our control system. We were having uh, knobs, we were having faucets. This was the automation system. And this was the way we were interacting with the things that we had to interact with. So don't get me wrong, not everything has to be automated. For example, consider a house. A house has way too many elements to think of, right? A roof is providing a function, but has nothing to do with us, hopefully. A roof has a function, it's supposed to create a barrier between us and our surrounding environment. It protects us against rain, against sun, or whatever, right? But it has nothing to do with us. Our focus today is to minimize the things that take so, many, so much time from us, or we have to interact with every day. So for example, consider agriculture and farming. 100 years ago, you had to do everything with hand, right? But right now, today, we design system that the farmer can sit back in the office and let everything run by itself. They look at how much acid is there, how much uh, potassium this kind of like, you know, uh, green is taking, or what's the level of uh, the pH of uh, the soil and the water going through the surrounding environment. So that's basically how we can create more production and moving forward. This was before. Today, with the magic of touch screens, with the tools and all the inventions that the people before us have done, we have so many great things to work off and provide more things to our next generations. So right now, it, think about it as pieces of puzzle. The invention days are gone. Today is the era of innovation. What does innovation mean? Innovation means just thinking about everything as pieces of puzzle. It's all about looking at the raw material you have, what are your givens, take them, and create something new for the work. And you don't have to be super genius to do that. All you have to do, you have to take a look at, okay, uh, what are the things that people in the past decade created that I can use to create more and more new things? This is what we're doing in the world of automation. 
Other people created Apple. They created nice touch screens. They uh, came up with light switches. They created uh, different things that is available to us. And today, we use the technology to come up with automation system. So let's get to the real part of the presentation. We need to think about um, how a brain of a control system is shaped. So how do we think? How do we look at things? Yes, it's great, everybody, everything that I said so far, you all know it, right? Okay, it's not magic. Sure, if I can make my life more efficient, great, but how? How, how do you approach it? How do you move forward with it? You need to take a look at things as systems. You need to take a look at things as subdivisions. Every time you want to tackle a project, you have been taught that you have to take a look at it as piece by piece, right? You don't want to, if you go ahead and try to say, oh, I want to build this house, you can't do it over the week. Obviously, you go by a plan, you go ahead and talk to your users, try to find their needs, then you go based on the functions, you uh, go based on series and versions of the architectural drawings, you probably submit it to the city, the city gets back to you, you have to fix the problems. And when you look at it in small pieces, nothing is too complicated. You can always uh, grow it easily. So when we talk about system, what do we talk about? A system is something that has an input and has an output. What does that mean? It's simple English. So. A system is anything around you. A system is this chair that has an input and has an output. Its input is me as surrounding environment, putting a force on it. Its output is to give me a balancing force. This light, the light ball over here is a system. It has electricity going into it and it has an output. It has lights coming out. However it's doing it, I don't care. It's, it's a system that is doing it, right? So that's how we look at things, right? If there's something out there in the world that somebody invented, somebody created, and is working standalone within its own structure, it's a light bulb, it's a thermostat, it's a chair, it's a table, and it's working as its own great system, all I care about, I look at its input and the outputs. So that's what I care about. When it gets to a uh, control system, we always care about feedback because when we talk about humans, we, um, I, I turn on the light, I see, okay, it turned on. But when we talk about computers and automating and surrounding environment, we have to make sure there is something telling the computer that it was turned on, right? So when we will talk about feedback, that's what we mean. It has to tell the computer, I turned on the light and it was turned on. Right? Something like that. Your whole building, a building that you're designing, it has too many systems. That's where the problem happens. If we were living 200 years ago, we were living in a little uh, small house. We only had one light bulb. We probably had a uh, wood chimney. And uh, everything was so simple around us, no problem. We could take care of everything uh, so easily. But the problem is that in today's world, there's so many things happening around us. Everything has an app, everything has a remote controller, everything has different way of controlling, and that's how people are getting frustrated with technology. That's how people are saying, oh, technology is bad, technology is scary, I'm, I'm good with the thing that I was doing before, simply because instead of interacting with one system every day, they're interacting with way too many things. They have to take care of a lot of things uh, throughout the day. So basically, what we do as control system designer, we want to make sure we give them one system that takes care of all of those systems, right? So as a user, they have to only give the system one input. Whatever that has to be done within those subsystems, your functions could travel around, could go around your subsystem, they can talk to each other, your Lighting system could tell your chair, your chair could have a sensor that if you have a pressure on it, it tells your computer that somebody is sitting on me, so turn on the light. Whatever that is happening inside that global system, the user shouldn't be involved. So this is the objective of designing control system. This is the objective of designing a building 
that doesn't require so much of functionality from the user, right? So yes, we are leaning more on um, computers. We are leaning more uh, on uh, how to design automation systems that take care of that. But you architecture students, these things that I'm saying is not just having a massive computer that like, you know, takes care of this. Sometimes maybe you need to think about, okay, if I have a large window here, how does that help the user to save on the energy and not go around and on the daytime control the lights too much? Depending on the structure that I build around the homeowner, how can I minimize their interaction with their day-to-day -day things that they have to do? Do they have to walk through the kitchen? They have to go around this hallway to do this and then go back? So the things that we are saying, minimizing your day-to-day -day actions, it's not just by automation. It's not just by uh, like, you know, computers that take care of things. It's about creating our surrounding environment in such a way that everything is minimized. Like right now, we're only talking about technology and architecture, because those are the two types of people in here. But anybody involved in design, whether it's electrical designer, whether it's mechanical designer, whether it's an IT person, you have to think about things in the same general formulas that work for everything. So this is basically the idea. So, and we as a human, we need to interact with minimal things. So that's kind of the uh, way we think as control system designer. You have heard the word IoT, AI, what does that mean? Um, Internet of Things, artificial intelligence. So there's a whole lot of things going around the world right now. Like, you know, you, you hear, oh, a smart home, a smart thermostat, a smart phone, so many smart things around us, and all these things are happening, right? So you got a cool Nest thermostat, maybe you heard of. Uh, you got <coughs> a nice doorbell that is a smart, that is uh, intelligent and you got things that you can talk to in your home and they answer you and it's super cool, it's super nice, right? But um, what is the whole idea? Where, where, where are these things trying to get? What's the future of it? Anybody can just create something and um, that sounds cool and that sounds scary, right? So it sounds nice and it sounds bad, right? So let's talk about a little bit uh, let's talk about two things. Um, how we as control system designers look about look at these things. So one is the injury aspect of it. How can we uh, minimize the interaction of homeowners with having all of these? Right now the problem is uh, most of these faces I see are, are young faces that don't have a problem with interacting with five, six different apps during the day, right? You probably open your Instagram and then go to your home control system. Maybe you got a nice thermostat, then you go to Snapchat. So you're pretty cool with interacting with so many apps. But the clients we have on the residential market, for example, all they want is that, listen, I'll pay you $300,000, give me a button that I hit in the morning and walk out of my home. That's the way people love simplicity, especially when we get older. Right? So right now, the problem is there's so many things being shoveled into our lives and coming into our homes, and each of them have a different way of controlling. Any manufacturer that creates a device, they obviously create their own controller for it. So if it's a smart <laughs> thermostat, it has its own app that you install on your phone and you can control. If you have a ring doorbell, then it has a, another app that you have to control. If it's, uh, for example, uh, a smart lighting control system, then it has another app. This is a problem. Right now, the solution is that home automation comes in, and when we say you have an integrated home, it's something that takes care of all of that, right? Is that one $300,000 button that takes care of all of this, right? So that's the idea of um, automation. The, the only way that this could be done, this is mostly for IT and building automation student. The only way this can be done is that you have to make sure you uh, design devices that are open source. What that means is that in today's world, you have to be able to talk to other manufacturers. You have to be able to, for example, or create this lamp, 
Sure, it could be its own great subsystem. It could be great for itself. I plug it into the lamp, it works. But as soon as I take this to my house and I want it to work in its new surrounding environment, maybe it doesn't, right? Maybe, for example, I want, I wish it had a, for example, um, universal power adapter that if I took it to Europe, I could plug it in there and it also could work. That, that's open source, right? That means it could talk to different things. I wish it had a sensor that it could adjust its light based on the brightness of the room, right? And uh, again, I'm saying things based on the mentality of an automation designer. You try to translate whatever it is that you're doing yourself, right? Um, so when we talk about um, <coughs> AI and IoT, this is what happens. We have to work with devices that are open source. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, any manufacturer that were creating something, they were creating something that was only working for itself. It's my own great, beautiful product. I have a thermostat. You want it, you want it. You don't want it, it's not gonna work with your phone, it's not gonna work with anything else. That's it, right? But right now, any manufacturer that wants to actually go on the market, people love to have their things talk to each other. It's the era of information. It's the era of exchange of information between devices, between elements around us, right? And uh, so that's what open source means. We will talk about that in the second part a little bit. Your information is going on the cloud a little. So uh, when we say era of information, your thermostat learns what time you're coming home, understands how many people are living in this family, understands how you're interacting with your home, and this is not um, future anymore. Like, you know, this is happening in homes these days. So a lot of information from your day-to-day -day lives are going on the cloud, are going somewhere that you don't really know where that is. And um, the whole war on artificial intelligence is about this, right? Some people say, no, this is dangerous. Equipments are getting smarter than we are. Um, surrounding um, technologies could take over us. Some people say, no, what are you talking about? Like we are designing this and we have control about it, right? So that's a whole war about it. And um, is this a scary? No, if you design systems right, not at all. The reason why there's so much education happening about Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, is for this, for this idea of technology is supposed to be serving us. It's supposed to make our lives easier, not to make it harder, not to supposed to create troubles for us. So the building automation systems uh, are there to put everything together, are there to give you a secure functionality. Nobody has any doubt about the functions that they provide. Everybody loves a simple <laughs> button that takes care of everything. The problem is the uh, side effects, the things that makes people a little bit scared when we talk about uh, your information on the cloud and other things. So let's talk about a simple example. For example, um, there, there are different types of projects that we do. For example, we got uh, commercial industrial project, where that is, for example, you got offices, you got retail stores, you got uh, industrial plants, uh, you got residential projects, where you would be designing a small uh, custom home, or you'll be designing a mansion, or you will be designing a community, or a residential condo. Um, and uh, basically, there is another type of project, which is your academic project, which is research project, which is uh, so each of these things have different objectives, and uh, you, you want to make sure you keep in mind what it is that you want to do. So another thing we want to talk about in the second part of this presentation is that step out of your academic way of doing things and think about uh, commercializing your solutions. Yes, we all have great ideas, we all have great solutions. Everyone wants to design a house that looks odd and has a little triangle coming out of it, but you gotta think about the functionality. Is it able to make me money? Is it able to sell? And it's all about selling, 
right? <laughs> and uh, I come from the business world, and that's why we always do everything reverse. In academic, you think about the functions, you try to see what is valuable, and what is try to, uh, this thing, regardless of how much it costs, what is the function that it can provide to somebody and make their lives easier. But in order to commercialize this product, you have to think about, is it going to be financially feasible for customers to buy it? So that's the different approaches you would have in any of these different uh, projects, whether it's you designing the structures, whether it's the building automation students, designing the uh, systems itself. Uh, so let's talk about a sample objective. For example, let's say in a home we want to work on um, energy management systems, right? One of the objectives of a smart home could be saving energy. How can we approach this and what are the different tools? There could be uh, four different uh, primary tools that we can use to, um, to save energy in a home. One is through data and optimization. So what does data mean? Data means uh, what is the outside weather like today? Is it raining? So uh, if I can collect some data about the uh, speed of wind outside and know uh, what's the weather like in the next four or five hours, I won't be overheating my home. I will be putting a cap on my thermostat, right? So data and optimization is uh, means that you have to be able to collect some data about the lifestyle of the homeowners, about the lifestyle of the office users, about the lifestyle of the industrial plant, and how they use the surrounding environment, and try to optimize the systems for it, right? And um, another thing it was about minimizing um, the day-to-day -day actions. So how does that help saving energy? A lot of times we uh, waste energy because we are lazy. Uh, a lot of times we forget to turn off our light because we don't want to get out of the bed and turn off that light at the front door. And when we have a simple tool, when we have an easy to use tool to do that, why wouldn't we do that? We definitely, if we have a controller on our phone that can turn the lights on and off, when it's time for bed, your mom is yelling at you, why didn't you turn off the basement lights? You can definitely use your phone to turn it off. So when the function is there, when the convenience is there, you would definitely make use of it. Uh, another thing is, for example, scheduling. Where in the scheduling, of course, if you uh, schedule your lights, another thing about laziness, so consider your home again. If you're living in a <laughs> custom home, say uh, you want to turn on your lights at night, uh, if you're doing it yourself, you go turn it on. Obviously, it turns on to its maximum power consumption. It turns on to 100%. And you probably will forget to turn it off at 12 a.m. You'll just go to bed. It's on until morning. Probably you will see the light when you're driving away or when you're walking away from home. And you're, again, too lazy to go back in to turn it off, right? So by automating things, by scheduling things, by trying to take it out of the lazy human hand, you could actually save a lot of energy in homes. Um, and of course, another thing uh, I pointed out to it is user experience. When you have an easy tool to control your surrounding environment, you would do it. A lot of times, uh, we don't do things because it's too hard. We uh, forget to uh, arm the house, we forget to um, turn our TV off because uh, we're, we're sleepy, we, it's too hard to do something. So when you create a uh, convenient um, uh, use human interface system, you can definitely do that. So what do we mean by data-driven uh, energy saving? Uh, for example, consider a house a lighting system for the house. From the injuring uh, proven data, since the uh, initial time the light bulb was invented, we always knew that there's a tolerance in the brightness of light bulbs. So for example, if you actually uh, turn on a light bulb to its maximum brightness, which is 100%, or you dim it down to um, 90%, that's not going to be visible to human eye, 
right? So if I'm sitting in my room, if you dim a light by 10%, I'm not even going to notice it. Human eye doesn't have that much of tolerance to detect the brightness uh, difference between the 10%. However, by dimming the light 10%, you're consuming 10% less electricity, right? So then you're saving 10% on the power consumption. Then you're saving money, right? So when we talk about data-driven energy saving methods, this is what automation is making things possible. When you have things on um, automatic route, a lot of things are possible. We could always have a dimmer in our home, a 30 box dimmer from Home Depot that we install and every day we go around, instead of 100%, we put them to 90%. But no one would, would ever do that because it's too hard, because it's too complicated. It, we don't want to go around the house to control everything. But when you put it on automatic uh, route and when you put it on automation, then obviously that's very easy. And uh, saving 15% on electricity is actually, uh, when you dim 10%, it saves 15% uh, and increase light bulb uh, lifetime by 60%, and that means you're uh, saving money, probably $350 per light bulb uh, for a five year period. So this is how you can simply save a lot of money by uh, providing multiple values. Our main objective when uh, home automation started wasn't to save energy, wasn't to save money because the customers of smart homes, the customers of integrated systems, were not the ones who cared about $350 for a five year period. Were the ones that wanted the convenience, were the ones that wanted to uh, discipline of the uh, lifestyle in the house. But uh, as the things are getting cheaper and cheaper, as the market is getting uh, lower in cost, then these things are starting to make sense. So um, another thing is, for example, um, on data-driven um, energy saving is uh, a, a topic called smart city building that George Brown is uh, working on. Um, basically, what that means is that consider a residential condo. This condo has uh, many condo units in it. Each of these units have, uh, for example, different things. They got lights, they got uh, power, they got thermostat, uh, things that consume energy, right? If you have um, multiple condos automated and multiple condo units within a structure that are collecting data and understanding how they can save energy, uh, we explain how you can save energy. For example, if you forecast the weather condition, if you study the lifestyle and collect data on how you actually start interacting with your home and find optimization ways to save energy on it, then you can go ahead and exchange this data with your intelligent neighbor, right? So if the first condo passes its own learning to the second condo unit, and the second one passes to the third one, then you have a whole large pool of data right? And these data can be shared with different units and you have more reliable data. Data always becomes more reliable when it gets to a larger sample. I'm not sure if you guys have ever studied uh, like statistics or anything like that, but basically these are, nothing is 100% when you talk about a small uh, condo. Like the data that I collect from your lifestyle is not going to be 100% true. Because maybe there's a night that I, I, as the computer of your home, think that the light has to be off, but you as the user think that has to be on, right? There would be conflicts, there would be uh, errors on it. Do you have a question? Yeah, so I'd like to know, how do you guys recollect the data by sensors and cameras? Um, yes, so collecting data are different methods. For example, again, think about, let's be specific. Let's talk about systems and subsystems. When we talk about, um, heating and cooling subsystems. Yes, there are temperature sensors that collect the data of uh, how the temperature is reacting in your home. And there could be motion detectors, understanding when the temperature went this high, was there somebody moving in the house? So that's one, like, you know, collectible data. 
or uh, there could be sensors on your doors. They understand that at 5 p.m. every day, this person comes home, opens the door, and turns on this light, right? So depending on all those systems and subsystems that are interacting with each other, that's what it means, right? They can, all of those subsystems can pass information. My security system is the one putting a sensor on the front door, right? If my security system passes information to my heating and cooling system, telling the door was open, the person arrived home, then they can, that can collect information. That's one way of collecting. So I have a yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, so basically, again, we, we talked about um, how there, before, there was maybe some guy, good marker, this. Maybe 10 years ago, there was a manufacturer that created a security system, right? This security system was great, but it was just a security system. It was just a standalone security system, if you arm the house and somebody opens the door, it creates a loud siren, right? But in today's era, we are opening access to these guys. So this security system can receive information from an outside world and can send information to the outside world. And this is where automation comes into the game. In a typical smart home, there's usually a main brain in the middle, right? So you could have security, you could have lighting, you could have HVAC, which is your heating and cooling, and you could have different systems, right? All of these guys will be interacting with that little processor, we would call it. There are different types of processor, but they will be interacting with that main computer for the house. So if the security system detects that the front door was open, it will send it to this guy, right? The automation programmer starts thinking about uh, maybe you as the homeowner, you always need to uh, turn on the light when this door is open. Maybe you need to turn on the pathway of light. This is just an example, we'll get to your question. Maybe you need to turn on the pathway of light when the front door is open. So this guy detects that the front door was open Front door was open, sends the information to the processor. There's a little um, if statement, if you call it. Uh, there's something defined in this computer that says, if the front door was open, ask the lighting system to turn on the hallway lights, okay? So same thing with collecting data, right? So let's say I have a little info file, a text file. Okay, that says every time the front door was open and the temperature went above 25 degrees Celsius, document 25 degrees, document the time, document the uh, lighting level, right? So this is how you collect the data. What you do with the data is another story, right? But when I say systems and subsystems, this is how you need to think about it, right? You, this is how you need to think about things individually. What kind of inputs and outputs do I have from something that is sitting in front of me, and how can I use it? This is where innovation comes into the game in a new world, right? Does that kind of answer the question? Okay. Oh, the security of it? I got the first part of the question. Well, like, it's very easy for the hackers, like turn off uh, yeah. hammer, right? Mm -hmm. So this, this goes to the scary part of that uh, IoT. Uh, the security is a very, very important aspect being talked about these days. Uh, not every system out there is secure today. Uh, we have stories coming in that somebody hacked into this old uh, woman's house and it started talking to her through her camera, right? Yes, there are very insecure systems out there, especially the DIY project that 
a camera that you go to Home Depot that you buy it and it has a nice looking app that you install is probably not the most secure uh, system that you want to use. So there are different things that you want to look at when it comes to security. It's a whole other topic, but let's talk about this guy. Yes, it gets scary as soon as we see this guy is passing information and the computer is passing information to the cloud on the internet, right? Uh, then obviously, e every time we got gates outside of a subsystem, somebody could get in and collect those information, whether out of here or out of here, right? This is where the security comes into the game. Right now, um, there are two different types of integration systems. One, the commercial grade ones that, uh, for example, there are manufacturers who have been building uh, processors, who have been building security system, who have been building lighting system for a long time. And uh, they have worked on their security. Is it perfect? Probably 10% of those manufacturers are super good. That they are on the government level. Uh, for example, Crestron is one of them. Uh, but probably another 55% are okay. The things that you put into your home, unless there is a CIA level hacker going to hack your home, you're probably good to go, right? There are, there are different barriers to break into your home. You got the outside world, then you got your internet provider, then you got a router inside your home, then you got different things. It's quite a lot of work and somebody has to really know what they're doing in order to hack into your system, right? But other things, there is probably 10 to 15% of the products out there on the market that yes, they're really validating your point and no, they're not secure. It's easy to hack them. We could hack them in probably 30 minutes to one hour and get inside your home. Is there a lot of things you can do? No. Um, you can't really like hack in and like, you know, go ahead and unlock the door unless you have put a $200 door lock on your door. So this is the difference. Right now, you could build a smart home for like $5,000, which is on paper is delivering the same functions, right? It's, it has automated lights. You could turn on the lights uh, on and off from your phone. You could do all the door locks and everything. Or you could build the same thing for five times the price. The difference is reliability, security, and all that stuff. So the answer is yes and no, until another five, 10, 15 years where there is government rules on all of this, where uh, there's more emphasis on the security. Um, there, there, you have to be careful about the devices that go into your home. That's kind of the idea. Yes? Sorry, so actually now you're saying that this technology, like any of this technology, doesn't actually make, I mean, secure, I mean, doesn't, um, <coughs> Um, sorry. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, you can't say that it will be secure anytime. Like, I mean, anybody. It doesn't depend like how much you spend this. It's I mean, nothing is, is ever perfect, right? So, you design a chair. <laughs> a chair has been improving for more than three thousand years, right? Probably, maybe more than that. Uh, so everything around us is always improving technology more because it's more sensible and it's more like you know you can feel it right but um, every day we're seeing oh on the Instagram you see an advertisement of this new chair that came in it's kind of innovative it's creative wow such a nice chair right but the chair has been there for a long time who could ever think that a chair could be improved right same thing about technology yes it will never be perfect uh, but we are talking about that final 10% reliability, right? Probably 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we were 20% secure, we were 20% reliable. Right now we are at 80, 85. We are hoping that within the next 10, 15, 20 years, we get to a level that is at least like, you know, 95% of people could have a smart home without worrying about security, right? So right now the only secure way of doing it is to go the expensive way, right? So that's the idea. But answer to your question, no. It will never be perfectly secure, of course. There's always ways of doing it, but we're just reducing the number of hackers that can break into your home, right? So the harder it gets, the better it gets, the harder it is to hack it and break into your house.
that's kind of the idea. All right, um, so yeah, basically the conversation is like once you have intelligent home and these guys can pass information, you're making things more and more reliable and the information can pass throughout the city, right? A condo unit can pass it to another condo unit. And imagine once you have such a big pool of data, we can have a sample of, instead of sample of four people living inside the house and studying their lifestyle, you could study lifestyle of thousands of people, right? So uh, that's the concept of a smart city building um, that is still in uh, research phase. Um, area, excuse me about that. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the concept of information exchange. So if you're ever designing a product, if you're ever coming up with a new system, something that is providing the function, don't just think about your own thing. Think about the things that it's interacting with. If you're designing a room, think about what is my room as a system, how is it interacting with the outside world? We are interact this classroom is interacting with outside world throughout the door. There is heat coming in underneath the door. We got glass, we got barriers, we got acoustic walls. So you always need to think about how am I going to exchange data and information with the outside world. If it's a thermostat, you need to make sure you are um, you are able to communicate, you are at least able to send information to the outside world. What is the temperature of me? What is, when did I get uh, to 25 degrees Celsius, right? So this is what we mean by uh, transfer of information. Uh, it's a little bit different on every um, structure, right? So when you're designing a home, your, your Priorities are different from a commercial facility when you're designing a hospital. Things are different when you're designing an office are different. You always have to do reverse engineering. On the second part, which we're getting close to, we talk about how you, in order to get to a solution, instead of starting from step one, you have to start from the last step. You have to take a look at what is the final thing supposed to do? What kind of need am I satisfying? Then start from ground up, try to get there. But the problem with most of the designs out there is that everybody wants to get to the final product, create a nice gadget, create a nice app, create a nice design, and sell it out there. But that doesn't usually work. So when we talk about commercial facilities, we talk about reliabilities. Uh, they have to be reliable. They don't have to look super cool. They don't have to have fancy touch screens on the walls. But if you have a government facility, the security system has to be reliable. Uh, and you can't really sacrifice that matter. Um, we care about system reports, collecting data. We talk about energy savings. Uh, and we uh, care about supporting the facility remotely. For example, when we have um, commercial design that their businesses are running off our design, they got meeting rooms, they got classrooms. For example, this classroom, if I come here as a presenter and the classroom is not functioning, somebody has to be able to remotely take care of whatever this control system is. Right? I have to be able to give a call to somebody and somebody remotely logs in and takes care of my problem. So this is another thing we care about. When it gets to um, condos, different things. There's a builder building. They never spend money, so um, you can't really automate uh, when we work on condos, we can't really go ahead and automate it for the homeowners and satisfy their needs. We have to automate it for the builder, which is not willing to spend, so that there are so many limitations outside the work, right? There's never, when, once you step into the industry, the first thing that pisses you off is that you can't really do what you, what you think is best. You have to work on budgets, you have to work on numbers, you have to do things that only sells, right? So. This is, uh, there's a lot of limitations out there on uh, residential, and this is why things are having a threshold, right? A lot of things make a lot of sense, a lot of things are good, smart homes are great, but uh, the people, the middlemen, and everybody that is involved doesn't let you have it, right? So that's how uh, things come in, and uh, right now what they care about, builders, 
they only focus on the presentation of the house, the energy management a little bit, and the profit margins for the builders, right? That's why uh, it's not really growing as fast as it could be. Um, that's kind of the idea about the design, the subsystem, the systems. And moving forward, I want to get a little bit uh, talking about for people who want to come in. Should we take a break or? <coughs> so I'll, I'll go ahead and move on. If somebody's tired, you can definitely step out and uh, take a break. So speaking of building automation. So people who want to jump into the automation world, you always want to jump in and uh, you guys want to like, go ahead and quickly build up a rack that looks good and like you know have everything working and have a fully integrated and uh, automated facility. But that doesn't work. Put that aside because as soon as you want to do that, you will be facing a lot of big challenges. You need to start with the basics. You need to, these are the steps on design your system. You need to first define your subsystems. You need to, you need to think about what is it that I'm trying to satisfy? What is it that I'm trying to provide? And what is it that I'm trying to deliver to the homeowner, to the office owner, to the users of my systems? So by doing that, you need to think about the functionalities of that facility. For example, if I'm building a classroom, this classroom is not going to be used for sleeping time. Nobody's going to sleep here. It's not going to be used for meetings. It's only going to be used for presentation purposes. <coughs> so if you're the architect and you're designing it, you need to think about functionalities. If you're the control system designer, you need to think about the functionalities. The architect thinks about functionality is because you have to design the geometrical orientation of this to provide functionalities. If you're a control system designer, you have to make the space they made, you have to make it functional. Because we can't just live in a big box. We can't um, like, you know, function in a, just the open square box. We have to make it function. Control system and automation is the thing that makes our surrounding environment functional. Right? So think about the functions, and then that's the time you need to choose your interfaces. What are your interfaces? What are the pinpoints that your user interacts with? Right. So the user doesn't need to think about how things are happening within the subsystems and how the security system is transferring information to a processor or anything like that. The user doesn't need to care what's happening behind the scene. What they care about is only the things that they see and the only the things that they interact with. So, for example, if this classroom is being built, I don't need to care about the studs behind this wall. I don't need to care about the ceiling as long as it's not dropping over my head. I don't really need to care about it. Same thing about the automation part of it. If I'm the user of this classroom, I care about this thing, uh, turns the projector on and off. I care about the lights, the brightness of the projectors and the visibility of everything, right? So that's where uh, how you want to think about your uh, interfaces and the customizability. So in today's world, you need to care about how to <coughs> fine tune your control system based on the specific needs. 10 years ago, if you had a lighting control system for a home, that was the same thing for the lighting control system for your office. That was the same thing for your, for example, industrial plant. It looked the same, it functioned the same, because they were all lights and everybody felt like that. But right now, with uh, like, you know, people getting more and more intelligent, the people that are probably paying you, excuse me, the people that are paying you are getting much smarter every day they uh, understand it, they know their needs, they need customizability. And this is why we also need to care about it in designing uh, the surrounding environment and the control systems. And uh, obviously, minimize the number of inputs. Minimize the number of inputs. Uh, somebody's called it from Somalia. 
multiply. Um, minimize the number of inputs that the user needs to interact with. Not always providing um, a lot of functions to a user is a good thing. Your user shouldn't always be able to control a specific volume of the spe speakers, control exactly what the brightness of this projector is, because it just makes things more and more difficult. Yes, having more options is good, but having way too many options is not the best idea. So in your design, you definitely want to think about minimizing the inputs and what are the key factors of that. And you learn that based on studying the functions of uh, your user. So um, again, this all goes back to this slide. Remember the systems, inputs, outputs. And it all started at the basics of understanding the system and the subsystems at your design. When we talk about the difference between school and industry, that's the difference, right? In a school, we do what we think is the perfect scenario. We do things that we think is great for the user to have, right? But when it gets to making money and when it gets to actually selling something, something that is commercialized and has profit for the company you're working for, the guy that sells it puts a list together and tells you these are the things that you have. Then they're giving you the final design, right? So they haven't done any of the system analysis. They haven't done any of the subsystem analysis. They haven't studied the functions of the user. All they care about is that how much commission is going into the pocket, right? So they just put something together, sell it to the final customer, and uh, come to you and say, OK, now you're the technical designer. Design this thing for me from ground. Obviously, they have some basic knowledge. Uh, and this is regardless of the scale of the company. IBM does the same thing. Apple does the same thing. The sales guy focus on what is going to sell. Then they reverse engineer it to, to see how they're going to get to that point, right? So as designers, we will always face that challenge, right? So after that, then you start with the basic. So if you're the control system designer, you take a look at the geometrical orientation of the house. What did the architecture do? How did they design the house? For example, if I have a kitchen that is open concept, uh, the number of controllers that I put in the area, that's one thing. If I have a house that is designed in small, small, small rooms, then I need a controller per room, right? So you gotta think about the functionalities, the flow of the user inside that house, and try to come up with different scenarios. The user is not always going to tell you these are the things that I need, right? They are only going to tell you the things that they think they want, and it's probably the least of the thing that they care about when the structure is finished, right? So basically, the idea is that uh, you need to consider every single scenario. If you are designing a house, you need to think about how the homeowner is going to misuse that place. So. Uh, I'll give you an example, an envelope opener. I always have it on my desk, but I've never used it to open an envelope. I always rip up nails. But I use that envelope opener for cleaning my nails. I use it to each my back. I use it to take something off the other desk. Uh, and like, you know, and the designer of that envelope opener never thought that it was used for anything other than opening an envelope, right? But we, as users, we are misusing things. There's so many different examples of these things that I can tell you, right? A chair designer didn't design it for me <coughs> to step on it and go change a light bulb, but I'm doing it, right? So as a designer, it's the easiest thing to think about the primary function. It's always very important to think about the uh, secondary functions and the misusage of a device, of a facility, of a structure that you build it, right? So maybe you design a little box that comes here and you design it for people to just put nice flowers on it. That never happens. They get a party, people come in and sit on it, boom, that breaks up, right? So architecture still need to think about that. Same thing in control system design. You design something that is capable of turning the lights on and off, is capable of scheduling something, but the user comes in and uses it and twists it around in such a way that you would never ever think about it, and that 
kind of screws up your whole system. Your computer can't even handle it. Your processor uh, is overloaded and stops your entire program, right? So thinking about uh, misuse is another thing. And that's why we got different versions and everything. Your iOS comes out, you got beta version, you got 101, you got 102, and things are expected to improve. But the designer that thinks about every single scenario beforehand, that's the one that is winning. Again, the process. What is the process uh, when you're designing a smart? We talked about it. Somebody sells it, gives you some rough uh, design of what is it that you have to achieve, but it's your job as a designer to start from ground, look at the geometrical orientation, look at what are the things that are needed there, then you design a rough and plan, you tell the operation team, okay, these are the types of wiring that have to go into the place, so um, even though everything is wired around us and everything is good, the new house being built, you care about the wires, you design your uh, system flow diagrams, and uh, then hopefully you will achieve and you're matching whatever the sales team uh, gave you in the beginning. And um, the building automation students. I know you all want to get to something like this as soon as possible, but again, that's not something you want to go right into. You go get to a job, and you don't start by building your app. You start by looking at things that function. Trust me, I've gone to many, many different homes. <coughs> Most of you will start with going to residential automation. That the guys trying to get that, but guess this, right? Why? Because they don't do any sort of planning, and they start throwing the equipment, and this is probably what we have in most of our home when we do things ourselves. And we just like, you know, put equipment. On demand, we plug them in. On demand, we put a ethernet cable to them, and we connect it. And this is not serviceable, this is not adding to reliability of your system, this is not really helping you have something that is sellable. This is not sellable. A customer is not going to pay you for something that can't be serviced. So, again, yes, a product would be nice, a smart uh, lighting dimmer could be good, but when we're talking about integrated systems, you have to think about everything about it. Everybody can make front of a rack look good, but it's very important how to make behind the rack look good, right? So specifically for the building energy series. So let me skip a few slides and... Uh, Michael, would you mind going back to the previous slide? It would be nice if you explain what the students are seeing uh, yeah, like I, I'm, I'm actually skipping a little of the automation slides because like we are having mostly architecture students here. But yes, basically when you're having a, this is for a residential project in Forest Hill that we have. So basically, right now when you design a modern smart home, instead of having uh, AV clauses and having, for example, your Rogers box under your TV with fuzzy wires and everything. You take all of your equipment down in the basement, somewhere in the mechanical room or somewhere in the control room, and every house being built these days has a dedicated control room, has a dedicated area for something like this, right? The scale of this could change. Like if you have a 3,000 square foot little home, you would have a small closet like that. If you have a, this is probably for if you thousand square foot home is a large house that has just more elements in it, right? Uh, and basically, uh, the way you start building this up, it had the AV receivers in it, it got power conditioner, it got audio amplifiers, which amplify all the audio zones. So for example, this house, I can count for you, uh, each of these guys support up to the speakers, full, so forth. So this guy has 36 rooms with speakers, right? So that's kind of the scale of the house, something like this kind of. Uh, and then you have, you, you even put all of your bell boxes, you put your Apple TVs, everything far in the basement, and that way you don't have any, the homeowner doesn't see any equipment, they don't mess around with everything, and they hopefully won't touch your control system. And uh, that way you can keep it protected. And any guy going into building automation, into home automation, they have to work with these things every day. So uh, you better be clean people. Uh, 
that's going to be kind of And not one of these guys. So again, uh, what are the stages you will be interacting with if you're stepping into this industry? You start with going to homes on the framing stage, a house that uh, in, onto the sub, you see plywood, you see the sub, you see frames, and uh, you need to start running wires. So it is very important to run clean cable, even if it's behind the drywall, uh, because that increases the reliability, the serviceability. If it's a commercial project, you're working with metal studs, and things are a little bit different, but the same concept and idea. Um, after the, and these wires are ran based on the original design we saw on the other slide, uh, and it's all coming from the original system and subsystem design, and then we created the roughing plan and somebody goes in and runs the cable on them, right? And then uh, the way we do it, we build our racks in our shops. So we don't do it on site. Uh, we build all of our racks uh, in our shops and guys start working on them. They build the entire rack, they put it into truck and build, take the whole thing and put it inside the home where it's functional. There are some other companies that build the racks little by little into uh, clients' home. Uh, but we don't do that because we care about the reliability and we want to do everything inside, in-house to make sure everything is reliable. And then after you're done with your equipment programming and the designs of that, you have to go in, start installing the equipment, set up your AV process, whatever that is. And that's where the fun part comes in. You can start commissioning and you can start uh, testing your control system. And um, how long does it take, for example, the wiring and doing testing at, on your shop and take the system to the oh, yeah. client? Consider at least about a year for a regular home to get a smart. Why, when, why is it like a year? Because of the construction? Uh, yes, I don't know. You don't work on a house every day for, for a year, but you're involved. Let's say you want to become a smart home designer, and you want to go work in the industry, you will be involved with your client for about three years or something. So it's not like something you sell and you get your check and you go have fun tomorrow, right? Basically, some, imagine residential marketing is more feasible, so we keep talking about all this. Uh, somebody wants to build a house. They're not going to just like, you know, come to you the day they want to start demolition, right? Uh, they're probably like you know planning to hire a contractor within the next six months. They have a home that they want to start demolishing it next year. That's when they start talking to you, and that's where you start to design it. After a year, with the delays and with the like you know construction delays, with the city permit delays and all that, it takes another six seven months to get things ready to get to the framing stage. Depending on how fast the builder works. Then, uh, depending on where your time is, your timing is, is the framing estate. So you will be involved with the architecture, you will be involved with the contractors, you will be involved with the homeowner or your clients until it's not even your turn, right? So before it's your turn, you, you will be doing a lot of design, you will be doing a lot of homework, you will be doing a lot of like, you know, back and forth thing. And that's why we build a lot of our racks in the shops, right? Simply because we want to do parallel work, and as soon as the house is finished, boom, plug and play. We just plug our racks, and it's hopefully it's work. Um, so that's kind of the idea. And yes, it, it takes a lot of time. It, it's a, you have to be very patient. It's a design market. You have to be patient. You have to be able to work with frustrated, and some of these, like, you know, rich clients that don't really want to they know for anything, you have to get every stupid demand that they have, you have to get it working. So you have to be careful what kind of industry it is, and um, so that's the design industry. Whether you're the architecture, you want to become a designer, whether you're building automation, you want to get into the integration work, uh, yes, every project takes a lot of time. And, yeah. Go ahead, I, I have a few questions. Just yeah, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. So, 
So uh, for the IT people who want to care about how we program these things, there are different platforms, there are different uh, ways of putting these things together behind the scene. Uh, there are some platforms that are logic based. So remember we were talking about if the front door was open, then do this, this and that. So that's one way of programming it. You, you obviously, again, you have to start with systems and subsystem, understand the functionality of things, and then you translate your homeowner's wish list into the programming language and into uh, your logic-based programming language. Uh, there are ways of programming these things, a C and C-sharp language, uh, if you guys are familiar with that. And of course, you have to do the fun part as well, which is uh, interface design and creating the things that your users interact with. And believe it or not, it, it sounds fun, but it's one of the most important aspects of it. Because a programmer can do the programming however they want to do. Like, I know my project managers, they go to them, monitor the programmers. They say, okay, just give me a working program. I don't care how you do it, just give me one, right? Instead of writing the uh, variables in English word, they could write it in numbers or however they, they, they're comfortable to do that, right? But an interface designer, they have to care about how the user is going to interact with it. What is the reason this button is red? What is the reason this light bulb is here? What is the reason on the remote there's a red button here and why is the turn on button green, right? There's reason behind everything. Interface design, a whole different five our lecture that you know, we could sit down and talk about, but we're not covering it today. But I'm just putting it into your mind that care about the points that your user is interacting with. Again, what I'm saying is about automation, but you architecture students, you want to care about anything that your user is interacting with. Your user is interacting with width of a hallway that they are walking through. Your user is interacting with height of the steps that they're going in. So these are all different things that we need to care about. We, as the automation designer, we care about <coughs> how the homeowner interacts with functionalities of the house. Uh, about the platforms, um, there are different manufacturers that create uh, different processors, different control systems, and uh, Arso is an integrated control system designer. So we take the pieces of puzzle, we say, okay, you're Intel, you create good processors, you are, for example, Apple, you have iPad as a control uh, device, we, we take that, we take this, we take that, we put it all together and we give a working solution to our clients. We are not manufacturing, we don't manufacture our own devices. So, um, if, even if we have to, we tell our manufacturers we, we want this feature, we want that feature based on the uh, functionalities we are going after. We use these types of uh, manufacturers to move forward. And I'm going to, uh, this is like my book. Could you elaborate more why we have different platforms? What are the differences? Yes, the thank you for that. I actually wanted to talk about that a little. I forgot. Um, so, again, same scenario that we said a commercial design is different from residential, from industrial. Let's say a single house that you want to design you still have different options and you have different roadmaps to go on, right? Um, so if you have a customer that wants to have a lot of customizability, we got clients who come up and say, uh, oh, this is speaker, I hear a little bit of bass and less of treble in the speaker. I want to adjust that, right? So, and until yesterday, they didn't even know they can control the lights with their iPad, right? As soon as you give them something, they go over. Uh, but you got clients who say, you know what, just give me a button that can turn things on and off in the room. I don't care, right? So depending on where the budget of the project is and what it is that you're trying to achieve, it is the designer's job to fit in as much as possible within the budget, within the subsystem, to give them uh, more and more because your wish list is always much larger than the budget that you're getting, right? So uh, yeah, each of these platforms have different functions. Uh, for example, Crestron is Ferrari of home automation manufacturing. These are the manufacturers that create, uh, those are like Intel for computers, right? Um, 
RTI uh, quite powerful as well, but less customizability. We as programmers, we love to have things that are open source. We can do anything we want with it. We can say, okay, if somebody walks beside this wall, I want to do this or that, right? Uh, but if a project has, say, well, ten to fifteen thousand dollars budget and you can't really do anything with it, then you want to have it because at the end of the project, it will matter. It will matter what your client is going to ask you. Right? So that's the basis of any design. Put, putting my homeowner hat on, um, I know some students are wondering in terms of price that we typically hear from um, a homeowner that want to go for home automation. Put in perspective, let's say a two-story, three-bedroom house, typically two, three washrooms, um, you know, Put that in perspective. Give us an idea about how much would it cost when we have a new build. Sure. Uh, and aside from the home automation, put in perspective the fact that if they don't go with the home automation system, how much would it cost them in terms of all the light fixtures, switches, <coughs> sort of the stuff, the stuff, versus if they go with a smart grid, how much is the price? Yeah. Um, of course you can tell uh, the cost of home automation and the cost of designing a smart home goes by a uh, number of components in the home, right? Yeah. You could have one single light. Hello? Sir, we have uh, what time is it uh, We're done. Six. Oh. Yeah. But we booked a room until 6, I believe. Do you have a class here? Well, I've been told that class is empty from 4. No, we pushed the room. from 6 to 8. <laughs> you have a presentation 6 to 8? 6 to yeah. 8. I'm going to wrap up in 5. It's, it's, it's 5.30. Yeah, give us 5. Okay, no, you should have come. I'm supposed to be here. Don't worry, we'll yeah. wrap up in 5. No problem. Uh, yeah, so if, 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 even if you have a, uh, a house with like, you know, one light dimmer, you can call the smart home simply yeah. because you have that smart component in it. And uh, or if you have your entire lights, you have them all inside the house, okay. uh, then that's also smart. So it goes by a matter of component. But let's say a house that size, uh, you probably are not automating every single light switch. You're pinpointing the functionalities, and you care about the lights that are more functional, that are uh, mostly used. You could start with probably you run you run the wires of the house for about three four thousand dollars, and then your equipment cost is about seven to eight thousand dollars, and with probably about fifteen thousand dollars you could get a starting point. So, like control for uh, with RTI or control for fifteen thousand. Fifteen thousand dollars you could get like five eight lighting zones, mm -hmm. maybe four rooms with audio. So like something very basic, which is more than enough for very minor living area. But if I want to go for full automation. So when you want to go full automation in that house, you wouldn't go RTI control. Okay. You would probably go into Crestron because you're injecting a lot more variable, a lot more components and subsystems into your uh, platform. <coughs> so Crestron is probably the way to go. Different people do it differently. But let's say a not a massive match. Like, you know, we have had condo units who spend $900,000 in the condo unit, one bedroom. Or we have homes who spend $10,000 on a 4,000 square foot home. So it's definitely by a matter of what it is that you want to do, right? But let's say an average project that you just want to automate everything. A good home uh, could go anywhere between $60,000 to $90,000 start to finish to automate all of your lights give you a good audio, so say 24 audio zones, and uh, automating your HVAC, automating different things, and the basic functionalities. Of course, a programmer in this area, like you know, they charge you anywhere between 90 to $150 per hour. So uh, if you want to become an automation programmer, there's good money. Like, mm -hmm. Our programmers what make about $120,000 a year. So uh, it's a good pay. But so what if we don't go uh, for automation, <coughs> have these systems in place, but manually, how much would it cost? I'm just trying to put in perspective that giving sort of option. Conventional, it costs you 50K. If you go to a smart, 80K. Yes. Give me that number, roughly. Yeah, uh, again, as I said, between uh, 60 to $80,000 is full automation 
full conventional automation. But, but if you want to jump up to like you know fully function, we got clients who say, oh, my house has to recognize me when I approach a house, right? And of course, <coughs> this type of client would be very particular about the finishing. They don't want to see the light switches coming out of the wall. They want to see them flush. So even the type of equipment that go into that type of house is a little bit different. And uh, you, they don't want to see any sort of TVs on the wall. So that means you got a little picture frame that slides up and down when you want to see TV. In your kitchen, you probably have a cylinder that brings your TV down. There's a lifter. So this is the type of things that a home, that type of homeowner get. And you're probably talking about anywhere between 250 to $350,000. What if you don't have a smart system? Just you still you still have to spend five thousand dollars for your low voltage. That's your secure system, your mm -hmm. TV cabling, your network. So the original thing that I told you, you're starting for fifteen fifteen thousand dollars. You're probably like five thousand dollars is already spent. So you're only spending ten thousand. Trust me, it's getting very cheap. Yes, ma'am. Um, so actually, like we you know, like you just explained that how to use, how you install the system, like when it's the construction site. But what? What are you doing, like for example, if the customer came to you and said, I have house, I've been here for 10 years, I want to install a smart house, smart house system. So like what actually like... So let's say, you, to, let's say I mean, you got a client, you got a client, you're designing a home for them, and you want to offer them uh, home automation and smart home features, right? Is that a question? You, you no, he already have a house. It's a retrofit project. Okay. For retrofit, some parts are capable of doing it, some parts not. Anything that, uh, there's different types of communication between the devices, right? So there are, for example, light switches. What we can do, there are radio frequency dimmers that can replace your existing light switch and we can wirelessly program them, right? But if you wanna, for example, have a multi-room audio system that, uh, and you don't have speakers in the ceiling, then you have to spend for a $600 wireless speaker, right? It's just the cost, it was much higher if possible, but sometimes it might not even be possible. So that's the answer to that one. Uh, that, you have a question, sir. Uh, is there a difference between a smart home and an automated home? Uh, no, that's just different uh, terminology. Automated means uh, you have this a smart home, means a house that has different smart home people on it. You have a smart thermostat there. Automated home means that you took a step further and you automated your daily tasks. So that means you schedule all of your lightings, you tell your thermostat when to go up, when to come down automatically. So, but in, the, in terms of terminology, all of the words are used for the same thing. In academically, that's the difference between it. Okay. So again, there, there's no really, uh, like this, there has been only automation for only 10 years and it's not in the dictionary. So the word integrated home, smart home, automated home, it's all the same thing. So same thing about that. Um, because, because I want to cut this up, let me just tell you one thing we're coming up with at George Brown College. Uh, we are having a uh, hands-on uh, training at George Brown College coming up. No idea when that would be, uh, but stay tuned. Uh, your instructors will let you know that if it's happening anytime soon. But basically what it is, uh, one of our instructors will come in. Uh, if you're interested in getting into this work, and especially